Mm -hmm. So that the, <coughs> this, is, this is part of the course, but not a required part of the course. Some will come, some won't. It's, they are all supposed to come. They're all supposed to come. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Everyone, can we um, get seated as quickly as possible just so that we can get started on our final uh, plenary session of the year? If you do not have one of the handouts for today, please make sure that you get one and that you remember to turn it in to your uh, ESF uh, faculty member or writing instructor by the end of the period today. Okay, so we are very honored today to welcome Shirley Tillman, who is the President Emeritus of Princeton University. She is also a world-renowned molecular biologist, and I just think we're really lucky to have um, had her come to speak to us today. Uh, President Tillman presided over many initiatives at Princeton that will interest you, including initiatives to increase the economic diversity of the student body, initiatives to improve the teaching of science and technology for students who didn't major in one of those fields, initiatives to ensure that women who want to pursue scientific careers get the support that they need to do so, and even, and here I know that you all will want to take a deep breath, initiatives to curb grade inflation. Mm. Okay, so you can ask her about that in the question period if you like. President Tillman's research career could not have been more fascinating or groundbreaking. In fact, I think if you, when hearing her biography, do not feel inspired to want to be a biologist yourself, there's something a little wrong. It's so exciting. When she was a postdoctoral student, she worked on cloning the first mammalian gene. She's done research that has improved our understanding of cancer and other diseases that have important genetic components. She was the founding director of a research center on genetics that is multidisciplinary. It's called the Lewis Sigler Institute for Integrative Genomics. By multidisciplinary, <clears throat> we mean that the center does not just draw on biologists, molecular biologists, but also draws upon the latest research in physics, chemistry, computer science, and chemical engineering. So it has faculty from all of those different fields uh, participating. President Tillman was a member of the National Research Council Committee that created the blueprint for the Human Genome Project. That's the project which mapped the entire human genome. And she also advised the National Institutes of Health's Human Genome Project initiative. 
She's renowned for her work on behalf of women in science and also for drawing national attention to the difficult career issues faced by young scientists. She's a fabulous teacher and won Princeton's President Award, President's Awards for Distinguished Teaching, presumably before she was the president. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes I did not give myself that award. Yeah. <laughs> Um, how a person can do all of these things is a bit of a wonder to me, and it is something you may want to ask her about. President Tillman says that she likes to tell students that, quote, I'm quoting from a speech of hers, a liberal education is designed to prepare you not for one profession, but for any profession, including those not yet invented. And I think that's a wonderful sentiment, because many of you will be working in professions that are not invented today. In case you think that her support for liberal education is simply reflexive, I would like to quote from one of her speeches. Uh, so this is, uh, this is President Tillman speaking. I went to university in Canada where the British model of intense concentration in one or a few highly related disciplines was the norm. In my four years of study at Queen's University, I could fit into my academic program only four courses other than mathematics, physics, and chemistry. And to make matters worse, one of the four was a required course in scientific German where we spent the year reading the papers of Albert Einstein, Werner Heisenberg, and Max Planck in German. <laughs> I found those papers hard enough to understand in English. German made them virtually impenetrable. When I graduated with my honors degree in chemistry, I was a very well-educated chemist and an ill-prepared citizen of the world. Having experienced both traditions, I am a fervent convert to the American system. And I'm going to go on to read a little bit more from this speech because it's inspiring. So, for example, when someone asks you why on earth you study history at college, tell this skeptic that the past is not an accumulation of dusty dates and facts, but a means of understanding our own times better. Had the second Bush administration read more deeply into the unhappy history of the British occupation of Iraq, then known as Mesopotamia, after the First World War, they most surely would have had second thoughts before concluding that this religiously and ethnically divided land was ripe for Western-style democracy promotion. They might have considered more seriously the psychological toll of warfare on both combatants and non-combatants if they had studied Picasso's monumental painting, Guernica, on a study trip to Spain, confirming the artist Paul Klee's dictum that, quote, art does not reproduce what we see, rather it makes us see, unquote. It is hard for me to believe that the Americans who support the teaching of creationism in biology classes had a good evolutionary biology class in college, or a course that explored the difference between science and religious faith. And no one who has closely read Toni Morrison's masterpiece, Beloved, could possibly fail to understand the lingering corrosive impact that slavery has had on our country. The glory of a liberal education is that one person could, in four years, acquire all four of these insights. So I hope that you will join me in welcoming Shirley Tillman to Education as Self-Fashioning. We are honored to have her. Good afternoon, everyone. OK, let's try that again. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. All right, good. It is a pleasure for me to be here to speak to Princeton's freshman class. Although I will confess to a little disappointment at a number of you who I expected to be in my molecular biology class this fall at Princeton, we admitted you, you didn't show. What's up with that? So I want to especially thank Professor Carolyn Hoxby for the invitation to speak in what I think is a very timely series of lectures on the meaning of a liberal education. The topic is obviously timely for the members of the freshman class as each of you begins your highly individualized journey of self-fashioning here at Stanford. But it's also timely in a broader sense. For I cannot recall a time when the value of a liberal education has been more vigorously challenged, both inside and outside the gates of the academy. From PayPal co-founder Peter Thiel offering to pay students not to go to college. OK, this is confession time. How many of you applied to his program? 
At least one, two, how many more, how many more? But here you are, and I'm glad you are. To Florida Governor Rick Scott proposing differential tuition for students depending upon the perceived value to society of their course of study, the liberal arts are, if not under siege, they are certainly being knocked about. Even former Harvard University President Larry Summers joined in the fray recently, questioning the relevance of George Marshall's claim to a Princeton audience in 1947 when he said the following, I doubt seriously whether a man can think with full wisdom and deep convictions regarding certain of the basic international issues today who has not at least reviewed in his mind the period of the Peloponnesian War and the fall of Athens. Summers suggested in a New York Times op-ed that skills and data analysis would be more valuable to today's college graduate than learning from history. Now, I would argue that both General Marshall and President Summers are both right. Learning from history and extracting understanding from data are both essential for an educated citizen in the 21st century. To a large extent, these assaults on the liberal arts arise in response to the economic hard times that have been brought about by the Great Recession of 2008. Critics who argue that a liberal education is a luxury that no student can afford are responding to the unacceptably high unemployment rate among recent college graduates, but of course they at the same time are ignoring the hard evidence that a college degree pays dividends over a lifetime. In place of the liberal arts, critics propose streamlined and targeted vocational training with an emphasis on science and engineering fields. Both broad liberal arts and vocational training are necessary ingredients for a successful modern society, but one cannot substitute for the other. For the goal of a liberal education, has, as uh, Professor Hawksby just said, has never been to prepare its graduates for your first job, or even for your second or your third job, but as I said in that speech, for any job, including ones that have yet to be invented. In a world that is changing as rapidly as ours, developing the capacity to learn new things is as critical as how well you think or how much you know. By training the mind to be flexible and nimble, a liberal education is intended to be a vaccine against obsolescence. Now it's ironic that these calls for more short-term and outcome-oriented education in the U.S. come at precisely the moment when other nations are racing in the opposite direction. Many have taken note of the immense creativity of the American economy over the past 50 years and have concluded that education in the liberal arts promotes in its citizens a talent for innovation, independent thinking, and the ability to think across boundaries. From the United Kingdom to Sweden, Australia to India, Ch China to Bangladesh, educators there are experimenting with more holistic educational curricula for their students because they believe that education that specializes too early and too narrowly produces well-trained technocrats, but few real innovators. But in some ways, I realize that I am preaching to the choir. After all, you, the members of the class of 2017, have voted with your feet, those who got turned down by Peter Thiel, at least, <laughs> and have matriculated at one of the world's great universities and one that is committed to the liberal arts, despite its well-earned reputation as a science and engineering powerhouse. Furthermore, Stanford is committed to a collegiate brand of liberal education, where students not only study and learn together, but live together. Now, the idea of a university as a residential community in which faculty and students live and dine together as an integral part of their educational experience is far from a universal one. 
Indeed, the majority of students at European universities, such as the University of Paris or the University of Heidelberg in Germany, very fine universities, are expected to either live at home or to find lodging in town on their own. The great British universities, Oxford and Cambridge, are exceptions to that general European rule. They adopted a collegiate residential system in the 12th and 13th century, not for philosophical reasons, but because the local townsfolk were exploiting the students with exorbitant rents and food prices. A reminder that challenging town-gown relations have been around a very, very long time. It was Oxford and Cambridge that inspired the design of the first American universities. In his 1935 history of the founding of Harvard College, which was the very first American university, the historian Samuel Eliot Morrison describes the thinking that went into establishing the college as a place to live as well as a place to study. Here's what he wrote. To the English mind, university learning apart from college life was not worth having and the humblest resident tutor was accounted a more suitable teacher than the most eminent community lecturer, meaning somebody coming from the outside. Book learning alone might be got by lectures and reading, but it was only by studying and disputing, eating and drinking, playing and praying as members of the same collegiate community in close and constant association with one another and their tutors, that the priceless gift of character could be imparted to young men. This was the thinking back in the 1600s when Harvard was founded. Now, while I fully endorse Morrison's view that what is learned in the classroom and in the laboratory is just one aspect of what makes an undergraduate education so powerful at an institution like Stanford, I'm going to take issue with the implication that the gift of character is something that is passively imparted to deserving students. I'm going to try and argue just the opposite. The gift of character is not a gift at all, but it comes as a reward for aggressively pursuing opportunities to encounter the other in all its variety. Now, I draw the title of this lecture, Encountering the Other, from a speech given by Woodrow Wilson while he was the president of Princeton in the early years of the 20th century. Wilson was a man ahead of his time, both as an academician and as the president of the United States. He was a true progressive and fought the status quo at Princeton a place that F. Scott Fitzgerald, who was a member of Princeton's class of 1917, described as one of the pleasantest country clubs in America in his 1920 debut novel, This Side of Paradise. Wilson had other ideas for Princeton and often remarked that the goal of a Princeton education was to make sons, and of course, there were only sons at Princeton at the time, as unlike their fathers as possible. So I want you to go home and suggest that is your goal at Stanford. He not only dramatically increased the rigor of the curriculum to the horror of his well-heeled students, but he campaigned for a new residential system along the lines of the Oxford colleges. But most importantly, he insisted that Princeton admits students based on merit, not social status, so that they had something to learn from one another by encountering perspectives utterly different from their own. Now, I owe my own awakening to what it means to seek the other to an amazing high school history teacher in Winnipeg, Manitoba, named Lionel Orlico. So at a parent-teacher conference at the beginning of 10th grade, he informed my startled parents that if I did not immediately change my ways, I was going to be brain dead in 10 years. Now, my poor parents had been used to having their 
parenting ego stroked at such conferences. They'd come to expect that they would arrive and be told that I was a good student and good behavior, and they would come home glowing uh, at the thought of what excellent parents they were. So as you can imagine, they came home that evening half shaken and half furious. Not at me, but at Mr. Orlico. But when I went to see Mr. Orlico to get more details about the catastrophe that was awaiting my brain, what he told me rang true, that I had been coasting through my comfortable middle-class life, in which I was not being challenged to question and defend my beliefs and values. What was his remedy? Join the History Club. How's that for a really exciting name for an after-school activity? And no surprise, he happened to oversee the History Club. So I signed up that day, and it was the best decision of my young life. For the next three years, I spent afternoons and weekends and school breaks discovering the world outside my comfortable neighborhood with Mr. Orlico and the fellow members of the History Club. We attended meetings of every organized political party in Canada, including the Communist Party, which was legal at the time in Canada, unlike the United States. Well, you can imagine how well that went over with my father, the banker. We visited Lutheran congregations, Muslim mosques, Jewish synagogues, Trappist monasteries, and Mormon churches. We sat in on sessions of the provincial parliament, city council meetings, criminal trials, and interviewed newspaper editors and commodities futures exchange brokers where I learned how to trade pork bellies. I am still waiting for the moment when that particular skill comes in handy. It was a glorious education, and it changed my life. Stanford has prepared the way for each of you to have your own version of a glorious education. In so doing, it has not relied solely on the faculty and its curriculum to expose you to the other, as important as the faculty are going to be to your education. Stanford has also deployed a truly powerful educational force, all of you. Hailing from the four corners of the United States and around the globe, you've brought life experiences, interests, and beliefs that collectively form a panoramic view of the world. And that did not happen by chance. When Dean of Admission Shaw set out to craft as diverse in every meaning of that word a class as possible, he was not caving to pressures to be politically correct. Rather, he was proactively creating an educational milieu in which you have the greatest opportunity to stretch yourself and to grow. If you are unpersuaded, do the following thought experiment. I suspect that Dean Shaw could have admitted a perfectly qualified freshman class drawn entirely from a 50-mile radius of this campus, or composed entirely of musicians, are composed entirely of math Olympiads. Would that have made Stanford a more attractive option for you? A more interesting place to spend these four years? I seriously doubt it. Variety is the spice of life, but it is also the secret sauce of a good education. For when a Christian and an atheist find themselves as freshman roommates, when a straight and gay man play on the same team, when a freshman from Nigeria and a graduate student from Montana share the same table in a dining hall, when a conservative and a liberal are cast as leads in a play, and when an Alabama sharecropper's daughter and a Silicon Valley CEO's son talk late into the night, they're encountering the other in deeply meaningful ways. Although it's always a little painful as a faculty member to say this, the powerful lessons you take away from your Stanford education are learned as often on the playing fields and performance stages, in dining hall and dorm rooms, as in the classroom and the laboratory. 
It's about making that last great leap from adolescence to adulthood. As a member of a close-knit community, living and working and playing together on this beautiful campus. Your encounters with fellow students will be an essential part of shaping who you are today and who you will become. Through the friendships you forge and those that you turn away, the moral dilemmas you face and those you sidestep, the acts of kindness you perform and the ones you dodge, the times you are brave and the times you are not. You will be testing your capacity and willingness to proactively acquire the gifts of character. And your likelihood of achieving those gifts is increased exponentially when in contact with those who are different from you. This argument was echoed by former Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor in her landmark opinion in Grutter v. Bollinger, which affirmed that diversity is a legitimate and compelling interest in the realm of education. And she, as she noted, and I'm going to quote her here, classroom discussion is livelier, more spirited, and simply more enlightening and interesting when the students have the greatest possible variety of backgrounds. One of my favorite examples of the benefits of flow from this variety comes from my colleague, Professor of Politics and International Affairs, Gary Bass. Among the courses that he teaches is one on human rights and international justice. And a number of years ago, he had in his class a student who grew up in Bosnia. The quality of the discussion was profoundly changed by the presence of this student whose family had lived through the war in Bosnia and Herzegovina and who could describe firsthand what it meant to live in a society that was practicing genocide. What could have been an abstract discussion became a vivid reality for every student in Professor Bass's class. And he, like them, I suspect, never forgot the experience. The ingredients for your self-fashioning are assembled here on the farm. An amazing collection of interesting and talented individuals. I suspect that's something you're already beginning to discover. With whom you live and study in close quarters. A beautiful residential setting, a train ride away from one of the world's great cities. And all of this is happening as you are poised on the boundary between adolescence and adulthood. A time of life when you are particularly open to having intense experiences and forming enduring friendships. Stanford has handed you a blank canvas on which you will fashion yourself for the next four years. But each of you will determine whether you will create a vivid and mature self-portrait or a pale imitation of your adolescent self. A lot will depend on your curiosity and on your courage. After all, it is human nature to seek the familiar, especially when you are in a new setting. A few years ago, I was inspired by the example of curiosity and courage exhibited by an evangelical Christian student who signed up as a freshman for a course I was teaching on genetics and evolution. Well into the course, she confided to me that she did not believe in Darwinian evolution, but had decided to take the course so that she could understand the arguments on the other side of the debate. In addition to curiosity and courage, it takes real self-confidence to confront the other point of view, rather than retreat into the safety and comfort that is familiar, to critically explore a different way of thinking, and to be open to the possibility that you might actually change your mind. I actually had two such students during the time I was teaching that course, one of them did change her mind by the end of the course, the other did not. But both of them, I think, showed both curiosity and courage in the willingness to find out what Darwinian evolution was all about. My hope 
for all of you is that you will seek a balance between the natural tendency to seek self ground, safe ground, which like ice cream late at night is absolutely critical at times, <laughs> and the courage that it takes to encounter the other, both within and outside the classroom. One thing I can promise you, you will never again find yourself in such an exquisitely engineered environment that is optimally designed for your personal growth and self-fashioning. This is social engineering taken to a high art form. So I think a question that Stanford would want to ask itself is how will it know that it has succeeded in graduating men and women who have taken full advantage of the rich educational opportunities to grow as individuals. I'm taken with a quote from Montaigne on the class website. He said, let the student be asked for an account not merely of the words of his lesson, but of its sense and substance, and judge the profit he has made by the testimony not of his memory, but of his life. This comports with my own view that in this era when universities are being asked to develop quantitative measures of student learning, surely the perverse equivalent of the quarter to quarter thinking of the private sector that makes long term planning so challenging today, the real test of a university's success can only be measured at the 25th reunion of each class. For your self-fashioning must be in the service of something far greater than yourself. If I might return to Woodrow Wilson one more time, he instructed the Swarthmore College class of 1913 the following. Do not forget why you are here. You're not here merely to make a living. You are here in order to enable the world to live more amply with greater vision with a finer spirit of hope and achievement. You are here to enrich the world, and you impoverish yourself if you forget the errand. For individual self-fashioning must produce a collective benefit to society in order for Stanford and its peer universities like Princeton to justify the enormous resources that we shower and pour into the education of each and every one of you. One benefit, among many that I could name, is producing broadly educated citizens who are cosmopolitans, a term that Princeton philosopher Kwame Anthony Appia uses to describe citizens of the world. As Julian Brooks wrote in an interview of Appia upon the publication of his award-winning book, Cosmopolitanism, the cosmopolitan ethic starts from the thought that human knowledge is fallible, that no culture or individual has a lock on truth, and upholds conversation, broadly defined as a respectful and candid exchange of views among individuals and cultures, as a good in its own right. Agreement is not the ultimate goal. Those kinds of conversations are the catalysts for self-fashioning, to be sure. But as importantly, they are the glue that will hold the tomorrow's world together. They enable a collective capacity to contemplate and understand the concerns and aspirations of others that is built upon shared experience, especially in the formative years of college. In this flattened, globalized world where India can feel much closer than Indiana, societies will need educated citizens with a heightened level of cultural sensitivity and cosmopolitan knowledge in order to prosper. So I wish you fair winds and following seas as you embark on your journey of self-fashioning. Know that much of the world's future depends on your journey. Thank you for the opportunity of speaking with you today, and I welcome your thoughts.
Right, so we're down to one mic uh, today for confusion. I am going to dash around very quickly, but just put up your hand when you're next in line and be patient and I'll get there. So who has the first question? <laughs> the most inaccessible person in the entire <laughs> audience. <laughs> oh, I was thinking. <laughs> okay, it's on. Okay, perfect. Um, so coming from a scientific background, do you feel as though you have a unique viewpoint on the purpose and the end goal of liberal education as opposed to someone who, who, uh, who went through the system and had a major in liberal education, got that kind of education itself? So does the fact that I, that, that I was educated as a scientist affect my, my views about a liberal education? I don't think it gives me a unique perspective, to be honest with you. But what it, what, it, what it does is it, it absolutely situates science as a critical part of a liberal education. So one of the things that I have um, done uh, many times over the years, I've been at Princeton for almost 30 years now, is teach courses that are designed for students who will go on to non-scientific lives and careers. Um, and and I've, I love teaching those courses, and I teach them with absolute passion and conviction that it is as important that those students who are going to go on and be lawmakers, who are going to go on and be CEOs, who are going to go on and be teachers of young children, that they understand uh, what science is and what science isn't, what scientific evidence is and what scientific, scientific evidence isn't. So, so I, I see, I think my perspective as a scientist um, is one that has always um, believed how important it is that science and, and engineering be an integral part of someone's liberal education. We had a question there. Okay, you've got the mic. So you mentioned the importance of a liberal education and how it allows you to have the courage to look at both sides. But in our world, it seems like to be such a strong and powerful advocate of something, it seems like looking at the other side would almost blunt your words when you're fighting so hard for a point. Well, let's take what is happening in Washington, D.C. right now as a, a way to think through what you just said. So we now have the most polarized Congress that we have ever had since people started looking at polarization back in the late 19th century. There have been studies looking at votes and looking at, at um, the passage of legislation and how often the, the passage is bipartisan versus on strict uh, lines. So you could argue, as, as you just did in your question, that members of the Democratic Party and members of the Republican Party are, are sort of taking um, their highly uh, passionate, strong, partisan views and holding to them tight. And, um, and that that is a way to proceed effectively um, in the 21st century. I would argue that they are the argument for the importance of a, of a liberal education's ability to figure out how you can hold views that are strong, that, that you feel strongly about but you are able to actually cross the aisle and be able to engage in conversation with the other side. Because what we have right now is gridlock, right? We have pure, unadulterated gridlock. And so that kind of strong position taking without the ability to hear, to listen to what is happening on the other side, I think is is really damaging uh, mm -hmm. in the long term. May I add a different scenario? Sure. What about with something, something like the civil rights movement? Would Dr. King have been as powerful had he given the other side a fair hearing? Well, I'm going to, again, I'm going to give you um, a, 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 another way of thinking about this. And, and that is, um, you know, Hillary Clinton a few years ago got slammed for saying that the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 required both the vision of Dr. King, but it also required the political savvy of Lyndon Johnson. 
when he was President of the United States. And, and I think Hillary, despite the fact that she was, you know, there were people who slammed her for it, I think she was telling absolutely the fact. So without Johnson's ability to cross the aisle, and in some case, actually, to persuade members of his own party who were deeply wedded to the segregation that, that uh, Democrats um, uh, supported in the south of the United States, without his ability to figure out how I am going to persuade those members of Congress to vote for the Civil Rights Act, we would not have had the passage of the Civil Rights Act. So I think you need, at different times, you need individuals who are taking different ways of figuring out, here's the goal we want to get to. How, what is it going to take in order for us to, to get over the goal line? And, and um, so, so I think it's more complicated than simply that, of course, uh, uh, Dr. King was not at any point um, going to um, uh, suggest that the segregationists were correct. Johnson figured out how to get it done. Uh, so in terms of a liberal education, um, what is something you think Princeton does well that Stanford could improve on? Oh, that's it. <laughs> um, does I think? So I, I am going to begin, it, quite seriously actually, to say that I am a great admirer of Stanford. Um, I, I, I think what Stanford has done over the last 25 years in creating you know, a, a spectacular university is, um, it, is extraordinary. So let me give you one thing that we do at Princeton, which, which I, I think is actually part of the sort of the secret sauce that makes Princeton alumni so completely crazed about the place. And it's the senior thesis. So we have a mandatory senior thesis. And actually, anytime anyone suggests that we do away with the mandatory nature of the senior thesis, the alumni just go completely insane, um, rise up as one and, and throttle whoever said it. So why is the senior thesis such a sort of an integral part and such a powerful part of a Princeton education? And I think the answer is because everything else is designed around it to get students prepared to do the senior thesis. So very deliberately, the freshman year, the sophomore year, the junior year, there's, there's a logic for how the curriculum is designed. And it's designed to prepare students to be scholars to be able to ask a question they care deeply about and then to spend an entire year conducting research and then writing uh, often um, theses that are just of stunning, stunning quality. And when you, you know, I, as president, as you can imagine, I spend a lot of time with Princeton alumni over the last 12 years. And when I asked them what was the most meaningful part of their Princeton education, they would say two things. They would say the senior thesis, and you know, they can tell you everything about their senior thesis, no matter what their age is, they can tell you about it. And the other, which is why I wanted to talk today about what I talked about, is the deep friendships they formed. And I think that friendships really begin with this close residential community that, that I think uh, you have at Stanford and that we have at Princeton. But I think the senior thesis would be the thing that I but I think we, we are very proud uh, that we have a mandatory senior thesis. Yes. Oh, yes. OK. I've heard the, grade in, the curbing of grade inflation at Princeton has caused like, increased competition like, between students, especially like pre-meds. And I'm just wondering, like, do you think this uh, reduces collaboration and discussion between students in their like, learning communities, residences, and uh, reduces the effectiveness of the character building there? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I, I think that the, the, the way in which we as a faculty and as a university administration began 
thinking through how can we ensure that the grading system has integrity um, was, was handled very poorly at a communication level. So, so I will tell you what motivated us to start thinking about it 10 years ago. And that was the realization that we were grading completely differently in different parts of the curriculum. There were some departments that were giving 80% A's, and there were some departments that were giving 20% A's. And that had been a long-standing practice. And so the question we started with is, is that fair? You know, is that really fair for students, particularly those who were in the 20% departments? Um, many of them didn't know they were in a 20% department, but a lot of them were in 20% departments. So we were trying to actually create a fairer system. But the way it ended up playing out was um, appearing as though we were being punitive in some way uh, to the student body. And, and frankly, that's one of the things I regret the most about my time as president, is that we, we didn't really articulate what we were trying to do clearly enough. On yes. a more personal note, I was wondering what challenges you faced as a woman in academia throughout your career, or whether you don't feel that that's affected your career in any way. You know, I feel as though I had um, an extremely um, easy path if you want to think about it that way, um, through academic science. Um, and, and I attribute it to a number of things. I attribute it to wonderful mentors. Um, both were male. You know, my graduate mentor and my postdoctoral mentor were both men who were immensely supportive of me and, and the work that I was doing. Um, so I think I, I benefited from that in ways that I know many women don't have that experience, and it's one of the reasons I've worked so hard uh, over the many years now to, to help smooth the path for more women to think about careers in academic science. Um, so, so no, I don't have, you know, sort of tales to tell. Um, I, I was one of the lucky ones. And of course, one of the reasons I'm here is that I was one of the lucky ones. Right? Yeah. Yes. Hi. Um, so we often talk about the dangers of vocational training unassisted by liberal education. But what are the dangers of its converse? You mean a liberal education without vocational training? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, uh, that's a really wonderful question, actually. And, and I think that. Um, without knowing precisely how the curriculum gets organized here at, at Stanford, let me tell you how I think about that question at Princeton, which is we have actually two things we're trying to achieve. One is breadth. And, you know, we have distribution requirements and students have to take this, that, and the next thing to ensure that everybody's getting the kind of breadth that, that um, I was talking about. But we don't want dilettantes. And so by the time you're a junior, we are asking you to choose. And we're asking you to choose you know, one discipline and then to pursue that with deep, going deep. So you're learning to do breath, but you're not a dilettante. So you're learning one discipline in great depth. Now, will that discipline determine what you do for the rest of your life? Not in a literal sense, I don't think it will. You know, I, I often used to say that, that two of my most memorable students was a student who was a classics major who took my science for non-scientist class, who's now an orthopedic surgeon, and one of my concentrators who did her senior thesis in my lab who now teaches theology at Villanova. You know, both of them incredibly productive members of society, but, but what they studied trained their mind but not in a narrow way that, that precluded them from following their interests after graduation. So I think both are important. Breath is important. The ability to go deep into a discipline is really important. And, and all this talk about interdisciplinarity, and you'll hear it a lot here at Stanford because you'll hear it virtually at every university where there's a lot, it, no matter what the, the, whether it's in the humanities or whether it's in engineering, 
The one thing I always say is, remember, when you're going to go into an interdisciplinary environment, you've got to bring to that environment a toolkit. And that toolkit is more likely than not to be within one of the disciplines that constitute the interdisciplinary. You're not going to try and be an expert in all the disciplines. You're going to develop a toolkit, and that's what you bring to the table. Hi, um, this question may not be directly related to, to um, liberal education, but I guess perhaps um, a fulfilling life. Um, I was reading on Chinese Facebook yesterday, and then there was a post on um, a, a kid was like our age, was with dreams, was um, telling her mom probably in a teasing way, hey mom, your life doesn't have a dream. And her mom responded that, uh, oh, I do have a dream. It's here, it's you. And how would you respond to that? Well, um, you know, um, I would say that as a mother, I understand exactly what that mother said. Um, the day you become a mother or a father, I don't think this is restricted, <laughs> this isn't gender based, um, you begin to dream about your child and you want the very best for your child and um, it becomes an enormous part of who you are and how you live your life. It doesn't preclude you having other dreams. You know, parenthood is, it, it is not an all-consuming uh, proposition. It allows you to have uh, other dreams. But there is no question that one of the most powerful dreams that you have, if you have a child, is the dream for the, for the good of that child. Um, is it, you mean, is it a fulfilling life if you do not have a dream? Like do not have other dreams beyond your family or, or your children? Um, it would have been impossible for me. Let's put it that way. Um, and I can't speak for other people, but for me, um, uh, having, being, have, living a life where I could have a very successful career and raise two absolutely beautiful children who are both employed, yes, <laughs> um, was just wonderful. Um, so suppose that you have a student who graduates from Princeton this year with a wonderful liberal, edu liberal education. What should, after they've graduated, should they prioritize their own happiness and living like a fulfilling life for them? Or should their priority be societal benefit with this wonderful liberal, liberal education they've received? So you've, you've framed that as though these cannot be one and the same. And what I would say is your goal should be to find a way to live your life where both of those are achieved, where you are personally fulfilled, you, you have a dream, you follow the dream, but in so doing, you are also contributing to society. And I think there, you know, there are many ways, I mean literally infinite number of ways to contribute to society. But, but thinking it through, I think is really an important thing. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't sort of frame it the way you did as though these are mutually exclusive. I think they, I think in the best lives, they actually are completely coincident with one another. Sure. So I guess I'm not asking, I'm, I'm not denying that those two can coexist. I'm asking if there, if you have to choose one, what should an individual do in that scenario? I guess as I have increasingly thought about the, the nature of the education that, that all of you are going to receive here at Stanford, I think it comes with some responsibility. Um, because of course, you are not, you know, all of you know, no matter whether your family is paying full tuition or not, none of you are really paying the full cost of your education. Your education is being underwritten by literally generations and generations of Stanford graduates who are you know, subsidizing probably at least 50% of the cost of your education. I think that comes with some responsibility, myself. 
Um, how do you think liberal education can be improved? It seems like a large number of our congressmen or the people leading our world are graduates from elite liberal institutions, and yet we still have gridlock and international problems that yeah. are supposed to be solved by their education. But it seems that they didn't take in very much of their liberal education. So do not, don't, don't, uh, doesn't the ideal liberal education imply an ideal student in a sense? And how can you make sure we as students take the most of our liberal educations? You know, the only answer that I can really give to that wonderful question is, is the lecture that I just gave, which is to think about the next four years as you are proactively, you yourself are proactively seeking to extract as much as you can from Stanford, and that will include a lot of learning, but it's also going to incur, it, uh, require the kinds of conversations that I think, I often think about these, these residential colleges and the between 18 and 22 years old, it's kind of like a hothouse. It's, it, and your hothouse flowers in a way. That is, this is the time for, for you to really figure out who you are and what you want out of your life and what you hope to contribute in the, in the future. And yes, will it succeed with every student? Absolutely not. Ted Cruz is a Princeton graduate. I rest my case. <laughs> I can say stuff like that now that I'm not president. <laughs> Before I couldn't say that, but now I can say it. You know, uh, we fail. We fail. So on the, on the other side, I have to say, Sonia Sotomayor is a Princeton graduate. We succeeded. You mentioned a lot about encountering the other, but how does the isolation of college campuses, a lot's talked about the Stanford bubble, and I know Princeton's also a relatively isolated school, yeah. affect one's ability not just encounter the other on campus, but encounter people who aren't necessarily receiving an education? Yeah, that's a, that's a really uh, important um, question, I think. And, and in a way, I wish I'd addressed it in the lecture. Um, uh, for example, I can tell you that um, if you are a student at a place like Columbia, um, you do have a different experience. I really, you know, my, my daughter was a graduate student in Columbia, and so I know um, the, the kind of experience that she had, because what happens is the city becomes the campus, right? And so you are out more in the world, absolutely, in, in a way that you're not here at Stanford, um, or God knows, at Princeton, right? Um, I think, I think um, the solution to that is to leave the campus. And, you know, I know Stanford is very good at um, encouraging you to think about studying abroad. The one thing I would say is to encourage you to think about study abroad programs that get you out of the Stanford bubble. You know, the problem with some study abroad programs is you just take the Stanford bubble, you move it, you know, to the Loire Valley, and you have a Stanford experience. How, you know, it's something, but it's not what you want and what your question suggested. So as you think about using your summers and using, using potential study abroad, think about opportunities to get you out into that world that isn't the privileged, privileged world of Palo Alto and of um, Stanford University. Because no matter what your background, by definition, the fact that you are here puts you in a highly privileged class, no question. Hi. Um, you spoke of your love of the study of history while in high school. Um, what led you eventually to the decision to study the sciences? <laughs> So, um, so I really think um, it was two things. I loved math. I just was crazy about math. And I loved puzzles. I still love puzzles. I still am sort of almost an obsessive puzzle doer. Don't hand me a puzzle. Mm -hmm. um, and I think those 
as, as I went through high school um, and was trying to decide, and actually the, you know, I was talking earlier about the decision point was actually English versus chemistry uh, as I went into college, you know, I, I think what I decided, rightly or wrongly, is that I would always be able to get the benefit from reading literature on my own. I couldn't learn chemistry on my own. And so I went in that direction. Now that I have many friends who are English scholars, of course, I know how wrong I was to think that my, you know, amateur reading um, is equivalent to the study of English literature. But that was how I made my decision. Um, so I have two kind of unrelated questions. One, getting back to the study abroad comments. Um, I know Princeton has a program, I believe it's for freshmen, um, to go abroad for a year before they enter the, yep. um, the university. And I was just wondering um, what kind of skills does that program give its students before they enter into Princeton? And then my second question that's completely unrelated is, um, as a female, um, as a scientist, and as university president, this is kind of getting back to your point, um, in which of those two arenas, I guess, did you face the most obstacles? Because both of those fields are usually dominated by males. Right. So um, let me answer the first question. Um, the Bridge Year program uh, is indeed a program that once you are accepted to Princeton and you have decided you're coming, unlike all of you, um, we give you the option of spending a year abroad um, doing public service. And so these programs are in China, India, Peru, Senegal, um, missing a country. And it is really doing what we refer to as humble work. We created the program for a whole series of reasons. One is Princeton's informal motto is Princeton in the nation's service and the service of all nations. And we felt that it was important that we embody that in more than just words. The second is we wanted just like uh, the question, the earlier question, we wanted to get students out into the world. And we were having a hard time getting them out once they got to Princeton. They liked it, they wouldn't leave. So we decided, let's send them away before they even get here. And, and then the third um, was something that all of you I may sympathize with, and that is we were seeing a lot of students arriving at Princeton at the beginning of freshman year exhausted from learning, or maybe more correctly, exhausted from getting into Princeton, Exhausting from, exhausted from what it took to get into a university like Princeton. And we thought it would be a wonderful thing to give students kind of a pause where they were focused not on the next career goal, but on serving others. And, um, all I can say is, as we have grown that program, the students who come back to the pro from that year abroad um, make me weep. You know, the stories that they tell about the transformation in their lives. They encountered the other, in, in sometimes in quite profound and challenging ways. They went out and they encountered the other. And they are changed for life really changed for life. So we're very proud of that program, actually. Um, in terms of whether being a scientist versus being an academic administrator was a more challenging, I think there was no question the early days of being a woman in science was the more challenging. Just, you know, yes, I had these two wonderful mentors, and I absolutely did. But, um, you know, I was always the odd man out in the room. Um, you know, I was always the, the one girl in the room. I was always the, you know, the, the one woman speaker at a meeting. Um, now it's much better now. Things have really uh, significantly improved. But it, you, you, you don't know what it feels like to be a minority until you are a minority. You know, you just can't know what that feels like. And so I think that was harder. I think by the time I became the president of the university, there were enough women assuming those kinds of roles. That it, honestly, I, I kept saying as, as I was being interviewed and people said, you know, how does it feel to be the first woman president of Princeton? And I said, I, I don't think of myself that way. I think of myself as the 19th president 
and my tenure will be judged by the same standards that are going to be used to judge the 18th, the 17th, and the 21st president of Princeton. No one's going to care that I was a woman, I don't think. Hi. Hi. Uh, so my question had to do with earlier in your <coughs> earlier in your speech, you said that other countries were moving towards science, technology majors, and uh, while the U.S. was still, to a certain degree, supporting the liberal arts education, and you said that the advantage that this gave us was that we had a more creative economy, and so my question is. Should we really look for the benefits, the true benefits of the liberal arts education? Should we look for it in the economy? Because I think that personally, I'm pretty sure that STEM, science, technology majors come out with a higher unemployment rate or whatever GDP output. But I'm not saying this because I'm not a supporter of the liberal arts education. I'm saying that maybe we should look for the benefits in society or in individuals or in another realm other than yeah. strictly the economy. Yeah, I, and I, I actually completely agree with that statement of yours. Um, um, that that, that when, when you listen to those countries talking about why they're exploring the liberal arts as a, as a different way, I remember 10 years ago going to Singapore and um, you know, I was visiting colleges and people in the government and so on. That's all they wanted to talk about. They wanted to talk about, so explain the liberal arts again, because you know, Singapore has a very career-oriented, directed educational system. Now they're exploring the liberal arts. And I think their rationale was maybe that's one of the reasons that the American you know, second half of the 20th century was so successful. But I agree with you that I think that can't be the only rationale for why we continue to hold to the liberal arts as the mechanism for educating, a, you know, not the entire college-going population by any means. I think one of the great things about America is that there are different educational solutions for lots and lots of different students. But the fact that we still hold to this broad liberal arts education, I think does have the potential to make us a better people. Absolutely. Despite the Congress. So um, you kind of alluded to the answer to this in the, well, a little bit in this last question. But um, given different levels of like, uh, people's ability to pay for college and yeah. um, different abilities uh, to you know, grasp the, the benefits of a liberal education. Um, would you say that there are certain circumstances where it doesn't make sense to teach people in a liberal manner, that it only makes sense to give them a vocational training? Uh, and if so, like, where would you kind of draw the lines on this kind of uh, paradigm? Yeah. Yeah, that's a serious question, um, uh, and that is, and, and as in a way, I think I began to talk about it in the answer to the last question, which is, um, you know, one of the things I think I said in the speech is, is, is strong vocational training and liberal arts are, are both necessary for this country to function well. You know, I, I just spent the, Lond the summer in London where there is not a single English plumber left in the country. They, they forgot to train future plumbers about 20 years ago, and now all the plumbers come from Poland. It's the most extraordinary thing. Um, you know, you need plumbers, right? You need plumbers. Here's, here's what I say um, in answer to what I think is the deeper question that you were asking, which is, who gets to be a plumber, and who gets to come to Stanford and benefit from a liberal arts education. How do we decide that as a society? And I think it, you know, I'll go back to good old Woodrow Wilson and say that I think it has to be based on academic merit because what is required of all of you for the next four years here at Stanford is going to be really serious, hard academic work. And 
if you are not prepared and ready for it, you will, you know, you will stumble and fall, right? There's no question. So there has to be, there has to be sort of academic merit is part of the answer to the question. But, and here's where Professor Hawksby can talk to you um, brilliantly and with great uh, knowledge. Academic merit cannot be a substitute for social status. And so if we have a society, if we have a, a country where, as we do now, the best predictor of SAT score is family income, we are creating an unfair, unlevel playing field that will ensure that the students who get to come to Stanford are going to come from a different social class than the students who get to be the plumbers. And I think this is one of the most critical issues of our time, is the degree to which education inequality is getting wider and wider and wider in this country. And I hope at least some fraction of you here in this room will go out and become education reformers because we need you desperately to be thinking about how, how, how can we create a society where you know, the likelihood of a brilliant student who grows up on Park Avenue and a brilliant student who grows up in the LA Barrio have an equal chance to come to Stanford. So you were talking about how oftentimes you were the only female in a room full of scientists. So I think in that case, you were the other that you're talking about, <laughs> and that you were the, the people were encountering you as the other. And so like, I'm a male ballet dancer. I'm usually like one of the few guys in the room of yeah, full of yeah. girl dancers. So I was wondering like, to what extent you think that education is contingent on not only encountering the other, but being the other. Yeah. What doesn't kill you makes you strong, right? Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. No, I think, I think being the other is, is harder, but, but it is, is another way to build the gifts of character. And, um, and so I, I, that's why I say, until you are a minority, you can't really know what it feels like to be a minority. Um, but you can learn as much as you can by talking to someone who is a minority and has experienced it themselves. So good luck to you. Okay. Hi. Uh, so, um, so I, I read a couple. So, I guess coming from a scientific background um, and seeing how society today is kind of placing more of an emphasis on the STEM fields, um, I guess. So again, your perspective could be a bit interesting. So you talk a lot about. Um, for example, having more women in science, um, you're a strong advocate for that. Um, and you talk about how when you were young, your father, instead of reading to you, he did mental math with you, which I thought was really cool. So um, given this kind of push to do more sciences um, in universities, and especially with the fact that in research universities like Princeton, like Stanford, the scientific resources are there, whereas if you weren't a part of the university, they might not necessarily be there. Do you think, what role do you think the STEM fields actually play um, in regards to university, especially when you're paying um, some, for many people you're paying a very high premium to attend these universities and to perhaps gain a degree for better job prospects. So remember that, I, th I think I would go back and say that, that universities like, like Stanford and like Princeton have really, I think, dual purposes. One is the education of the next generation. And the other one is the generation of new knowledge. Right? And that this is as important a part of what makes Stanford Stanford as the fact that all of you are here getting undergraduate educations. Um, if, if I understood your question, um, I think part of what you're saying is there's been so much emphasis on the, um, the education of more scientists, more engineers, um, uh, that has that sort of changed the nature of the university, which after all uh, cares as deeply, uh, as I know Stanford does, and certainly Princeton does, in the humanities and in the social sciences. Um, which, which we care deeply about, and, and are, 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 
have we got the balance right? You know, is is the is, is that what what you were trying to get at, or maybe I'm missing? Um, I guess the general rule of um, just what you see as like the future of most. I guess I think universities, especially big research universities, have a sort of identity crisis because if you really want the small the liberal arts education, where you're very like learning many different things, then ideally you'd want to go to like a small liberal arts college, right? Maybe, I, I do, because if, well, maybe you would disagree, but um, I would say like at a research university that has the scientific resources, that has all these things, then to take advantage of that truly, wouldn't it be almost optimal at times? I, a, a big cause for this shift to STEM um, fields is because of the yeah. big research universities and the resources that they have. Yeah, so, so, so I want to, I, I, I do want to take issue with your sense that if you're really interested in the liberal arts, you should go to a small liberal arts college. I'm actually a huge fan of liberal arts colleges. I'm on the board of Amherst College, and, and I didn't go to Amherst, but I'm supporting it because I really love what it is doing. Um, but I don't think that that means that you can't get a deep liberal arts education at a place like Stanford which, after all, is, as I said, a, you know, a uh, science and engineering powerhouse. There's no question it's a powerhouse. Um, I think you would have a harder time, quite honestly, at MIT and Caltech, which, which really have a different mission, right? They've defined their mission quite differently. Um, it's much harder at, you know, Professor Hoxby taught, uh, was a student at MIT, so she knows. Much harder to get the kind of breadth that you can get here at Stanford. Uh, so, I, so I don't think that's a problem. What I think you're, you're saying is that as a university, and I'm going to use Stanford as the example because I think it's the, the most vivid, as it becomes this powerhouse, is it at risk of losing the, the value that comes from the other ways of knowing, if you want to think about it that way, in the humanities? and in the social sciences? And I think the answer is yes. I think it is a risk. And I think that's probably something that the leadership here at Stanford is probably thinking about, which is, you know, did the pen, is, is there a risk that the pendulum is moving too much in one direction versus trying to keep this balance? You know, we've been preaching balance to all of you. We've been preaching breadth to all of you. Is the university itself exhibiting the breadth that it needs to really be give you the experience that you would get at Amherst College. I, I think we have uh, time for just one more question. Yeah, way in the back. Yeah. Do you think that certain countries are not ready for liberal arts education? And if so, what makes a country ready socially, economically, in whatever way you think? You know, the only, the only limitation that I see to a country being able to really give a broad liberal arts education to its citizens is its willingness to embrace academic freedom. Because if there are verboten subjects, if there are things you cannot talk about, things you cannot discuss politically, you cannot have a liberal arts system. It just won't work. Yeah. Thank you all for coming, and thank you especially for staying.